We're particularly happy this afternoon to have Dr. Kaldemeyer uh, with us. Is there anyone here who, uh, who does not know him? If I was going to reach way back to southern Indiana, you know, and introduce him, I thought there's no point going, going through all that if you're already well acquainted. But let me just say that we're very pleased that since 1949, uh, Dr. Kaldemeyer has been a member of our social science faculty. He's held most of the important uh, committee assignments that there are in this institution. And in recent years, he's found time, together with uh, Mr. Shirtliff of the Art Department, to look into Indiana history and to prepare for some film strips uh, illuminating some of Indiana's history. He's going to talk with, you, with us this afternoon on the general subject of the anatomy of a film strip. Dr. Kaldemeyer, turn it over to you. Since I'll have my back to the audience about half the time, I think we'd better uh, arrange for this uh, neck mic. Can everyone hear? First, I'd like to uh, comment on the title of this talk. I noticed it came out, Indiana History, the Anatomy of a Film Strip. And I must uh, add a comment or two here. Uh, in preparing this, Byron and I worked very closely with um, the director of the Indiana Historical Bureau and executive secretary of the Indiana Historical Society. And he was well acquainted with our many trials and tribulations. So a year ago, last April, he asked me to speak at the annual meeting of the society uh, to point up some of the problems connected with uh, accumulating this material. So I left the title up to him, and when it came out on the printed program, it said, uh, Confessions of a Film Stripper. Now, uh, I, uh, I told that to Mr. Linson, and I noticed that he has uh, uh, cleaned it up a little bit. So uh, he's called it the anatomy of a, of a film strip. And I, I must, uh, I must say that uh, the, the title's not uh, ill-chosen because what I propose to do this morning, or this afternoon, is to uh, show representative shots, after I make some introductory comments, about how we evolved this uh, film strip. And uh, first let me say, 13 years ago, I uh, inherited this course, Indiana History. Now, I have a major in American history in my graduate work, but my only claim to that position was that uh, I was the only native-born Hoosier on the staff. So uh, I inherited from uh, Professor Hurst 13 years ago. And not having taught it before and having had most of my formal education in Missouri, I uh, was at a loss for uh, illustrative material of all sorts. I uh, improvised maps, uh, charts, uh, portraits, but that was inadequate. And then two years ago, I got a letter from uh, Professor Harris Harville uh, at Troy State College, uh, Alabama. And he had produced a strip for, uh, a, a series of strips for uh, Dr. Uh, Cooper and Dr. Johnson here on conservation in Indiana and he was anticipating doing one on the history of Indiana. So he asked me whether I would do that. And I met him at the airport in Indianapolis to talk it over, and it came out that I would have to take some uh, pictures. Well, my photography experiences, experience is very limited, uh, confined largely to the box camera. So I knew that wouldn't be adequate, and I asked whether we couldn't take a partner in Byron Shirtliff, who teaches uh, photography here at the college, and in addition is well uh, equipped uh, to deal with the artistic elements of the strip. So it was agreeable and uh, to uh, Mr. Harville and uh, Mr. Shirtliff, and we proceeded then on, on that basis. Now, this afternoon I had several alternatives. One is would be to show our first set, which consists of six strips, uh, uh, 47 frames in each strip. And I felt that that would be a pretty sterile experience 
without uh, background uh, for the material. Secondly, I could have shown all 1,100 uh, uh, pictures that we took, and that would have you in the arms of Morpheus uh, within a half an hour, so I gave that up and decided that we would take representative shots to show uh, what we tried to achieve and some of the uh, problems connected with it. Now, so hence the title, Anatomy. We are going to bisect and dissect the subject. Now, I'd like to point out that when we began this, neither Byron nor I had, had any previous experience. We waited uh, until spring vacation uh, two years ago. We got in our car, we had a whole week off, and we toured southern Indiana, 832 miles to be exact. And if you ever saw two naive uh, operators, we were. As I look back on that, I don't know what we expected. I think we expected history to jump out and embrace us at every turn, but it didn't. We came up with some pictures of wagon wheels and little streams and a few monuments and memorials, but we realized that uh, we had not yet touched the core of the problem. So uh, we got something out of the trip, uh, had a pretty good time. But when we got back, we uh, uh, thought about other avenues. And um, one of the first things that occurred was uh, old illustrations uh, that could be found in the State Historical Society, uh, Library. Uh, the uh, Smith Memorial Library in uh, Indianapolis, as you know, is uh, connected with the State uh, Library and the State Historical Society. So we went there and with the aid of the curator, uh, Miss Carolyn Dunn, uh, and the uh, Indiana History Section, Mrs. Hazel Hopper, and of course, Hubert Hawkins, the director, we had access to all types of materials. Uh, some books well over 100 years old. Uh, also, the periodicals, the Harper's Weekly. And we, uh, uh, Byron set up a, a gadget, a very simple gadget, but was very effective that he could mount the camera on and uh, we could uh, take pictures uh, of small uh, illustrations, large ones, and what have you. So uh, with that in mind, we started uh, taking uh, these illustrations. Of course, we wanted the whole thing, in, uh, I might add, uh, incidentally, in connection with the illustrations, uh, we had uh, to concern ourselves with copyright laws. So most of the illustrative material that we have uh, dates back, I think, at least 35 years. We uh, wanted to protect some of it, most of it, uh, 50 to 100 years. Now, having wanted to do it in color since uh, Mr. Harville, who was on the uh, NEA Committee on Visual Aids, uh, told us that color is far more effective. and once you introduce color, you have to be consistent. You can't have a few shots in color and some in black and white. So on that basis, we uh, were faced with the problem of tinting uh, this material. For the most part, uh, we used uh, um, transparent uh, oil uh, uh, tint, uh, oil paints. Uh, we started out with uh, black and white, but found that the contrast was too harsh and uh, it did not lend itself to a blending process. So Byron came up with the idea that perhaps if we uh, printed them on a porous type paper with sepia tone, uh, it would make tinting easier. And we did that and found it, for the most part, uh, rather effective. Now, in touring the state, and I suspect we've traveled some 4,000 miles on this project, uh, one of the problems that faced us was uh, sunlight. You can be ever so careful in planning your itinerary, but if uh, Mother Nature doesn't cooperate, you are at a loss. Uh, we drive 200 miles and be in for three cloudy days, or we drive 100 miles to get an inscription on a monument, find that we should have been there in the morning because the inscription would be on the east side and we would have to take the picture into the sun. So those are some of the problems. and. Uh, 
we took quite a few pictures as best we could, but then we also exploited another uh, avenue, namely borrowing. I was going to add steel, but we haven't resorted to that yet. We may on the last six. But we borrowed freely uh, from individuals, from the State Historical uh, Society, uh, from TMS, uh, Miss Hope of TMS was very, I think we have just one shot we borrowed there, but she was very helpful in giving us uh, some advice on the whole project. Uh, Dick Green of the Muncie Star was very generous, gave us uh, seven or eight shots. Uh, but uh, one of the greatest uh, contributors was the archaeologist for the State, Histor uh, State Historical Society, Dr. Glenn Black. I'd had uh, Dr. Black up here to speak to the uh, Indiana History Group three different times, very competent individual, and uh, I felt that unless we touched on the preliterate phases of Indiana history, we would be missing a, a bet. So um, for about eight months, I hinted and everything else with Dr. Black, um, but to no avail. And finally, I just came right out and asked him whether he would uh, set out some artifacts and uh, help us take pictures. So we drove down to the Angel Mounds at Evansville, and after we got there, uh, he said, uh, you can just put away your camera. He said, I have over 6,000 shots already taken. Uh, pick them out. Well, that posed the next question, since the uh, archaeological aspects were something out of my field, I didn't know what to pick out. So then I, again, uh, got very bold and asked him why didn't he pick them out. Uh, uh, he kind of expected that, I think, so he did, and sent him up 26 frames. So the preliterate period, we are uh, greatly indebted to him and some of the finest photography I think you'll find. Now, another problem that faced us was what grade level were, would we aim at? As many of you know, Indiana history is taught on the fourth grade level and the eighth grade level in Indiana. And uh, if we uh, geared it to the fourth grade level, uh, mm -hmm. then we would uh, have to make a different set for the eighth grade, which uh, was difficult to, uh, to do. And if we, vice versa, if we geared it to the eighth grade, then it would be unsuitable for the fourth. So we split the difference. And uh, when we show some of these slides, I think uh, you'll see uh, how, how we worked on that. Uh, of course, that is not the best, uh, perhaps, but uh, it was a good solution, I think, to a problem. Then we also wanted uh, portraits, and we discovered that all of the governor's portraits are at the uh, State House in Indianapolis. Uh, unfortunately, or otherwise, I don't know how to say it, they, most of them are relegated to the gallery up on the third floor. And it's very, very dimly lit, and they are most unattractive. But I might just point out a little of the history of the portraits of the governors. When uh, Conrad Baker was inaugurated in 1867, right after the Civil War, he was amazed that there were no portraits of his predecessors. So he began a movement with the uh, General Assembly, and they took action accordingly to um, um, paint, appropriate money for each governor to have his portrait painted. And not only that, but under uh, Conrad's, uh, Baker's direction, they arranged to go back and uh, from uh, uh, sketches uh, or whatever source they could get uh, to paint the earlier ones. So we have in Indianapolis then all of the, uh, all of the uh, um, governor's portraits. So uh, Byron and I went up there two Saturdays. Uh, I was rather interested uh, the first time we went up. Uh, we had the Republican administration, and uh, uh, there are about eight portraits in the governor's office, and they were all Republicans. And then when we went back the second time to do most of our work, the Republicans had been relegated to the gallery, and now there was 
McNutt and Schricker and Blue Jean Williams, and of course, both Republican and Democrat uh, saw nothing wrong in keeping the portrait of uh, William Henry Harrison, who uh, of course wasn't governor, but he had been president. So we uh, uh, got those. I would like to add here that uh, I borrowed, in borrowing some slides, uh, several students uh, came up with uh, slides. And I might, one of them was Norman Brown, I just happened to see him back there, uh, was, was helpful. Uh, and I would like to give an invitation for the last half of this, if any of you have some slides that you'd like to have uh, handed down to posterity in the form of a film strip, why we would be very glad to accept them. Uh, another problem came up, uh, a manual. All film strips uh, should have a manual uh, uh, to guide teachers, I guess. So uh, we prepared a, a manual. Uh, this was my job since Byron confined himself uh, primarily to the uh, photography. And I started on a manual and I came up with something that I thought would be adequate and sent it uh, to uh, Harville in Alabama who was to take it to the printer. And <clears throat> I got a special delivery letter in which he said, what are you doing writing a textbook? Uh, this would have come out 140 pages. So he said, we can't uh, do that. So then I had the task of condensing it into about 40 pages. So I think there are about that many in this manual. So uh, it's a real problem Try to uh, tell a story with pictures unless you can have uh, some basic continuity that uh, a manual or some other device will provide. Now, in collecting the material, we also uh, found a disproportionate amount of materials in uh, different periods of history and on different topics. Uh, that makes it uh, difficult because certainly one thing you uh, aim at is uh, proper proportion. And we found, for instance, uh, war, during wartime, uh, in going through the uh, lithographs and uh, uh, various materials at the State Library, there was a plethora to tint. We simply took it in color film. But there are other aspects of Indiana history equally important, uh, in some cases maybe more important, in which there was a great uh, a dearth of material. So uh, that was one of the problems we had to reckon with. So if some of those uh, disproportionate features uh, show up here, uh, you'll know the reason. Now, finally, uh, another problem that we had was giving credit. Uh, when someone loaned us a, a picture, uh, we would like to have, uh, as a textbook would do, uh, beneath the picture put uh, loaned or by courtesy of so-and-so. But that is not conducive to a good film strip, so we had to, uh, in each case, and we borrowed some from General Motors. Uh, I just looked through my file the other day, incidentally, I, I have over 500 letters that have been written uh, to iron out some of these details. But we uh, would tell these people that if we could uh, give them credit in the manual, uh, would that suffice? And we had, uh, in all cases, it was agreeable to have it in the, in the manual. Now, finally, I'd like to say one thing about film strips. Uh, a good film strip, of course, is should have proportion. It should tell a story in itself. Uh, I think that too many times we find teachers who know the material and could use film strips effectively don't do uh, use them. And conversely, we have teachers who don't know enough history to get out of the rain, and they think this is a camouflage for their ignorance, and they use them indiscriminately. I, I can just imagine some new, uh, some beginning teacher who's never had a background in a given phase of history uh, running through a strip in about 15 minutes uh, and then being amazed they didn't understand it better. Now, before we project some sample pictures on the screen, I'd like to uh, give you the titles of the first six that we have finished. Uh, this is set number one. The first uh, uh, strip is called Preliterate uh, History. 
you'll notice we didn't say prehistorical, we said preliterate history. Uh, this deals primarily with geological and archaeological uh, aspects of uh, Indiana history. The second dealt with the very important French period in American history, and oddly enough we found uh, an abundance of material in this area. The third was called the English period in the American Revolution. We found uh, suitable material there. The fourth was called the territorial period. The fifth was called statehood and the sixth was the frontier period which of course uh, transcends several of these periods now the uh, when byron gets back from peabody college this fall we intend to complete the next five and possibly six uh, they will be entitled the civil war and uh, after um, one will be the agricultural revolution in indiana another the Industrial Revolution in Indiana. Uh, a fourth one will be the cultural and intellectual history, and tentatively we have uh, captioned the fifth one, the 20th century uh, Indiana. Now it could be, and I think we will uh, divide the uh, sixth strip, uh, the uh, fifth one into two, making it uh, uh, two sets and of uh, six each. Now with those introductory remarks and anticipating perhaps a few comments from the audience, uh, I think uh, we'll uh, present some of the slides. Now I would like to point out again, remember this is a dissected version of six strips. And what I've tried to do here was to, uh, uh, and it lacks proportion, I must admit I have too many maps to present, but they were so pretty I thought uh, I would. Uh, uh, so we'll have these uh, various groups. Now each uh, each uh, strip, of course, has a title. I said uh, statehood. Uh, uh, the title is Indiana becomes the state. I, Yes, well, that's, that's on each uh, uh, strip, uh, giving uh, Harville's name. Uh, the producer uh, was the American Society of uh, Visual Education out of Chicago. Uh, they were the ones that uh, produced it. Now, for the pre-literate period, we... Uh, uh, well, I, this whole group of, of slides that are to follow uh, are maps, and uh, one of the maps, uh, we wanted to show very graphically the extent of glaciation in Indiana, both by the uh, Illinois Glacier and the Wisconsin Glacier. So uh, while some wall maps have those, uh, they aren't very graphic, so that we wanted these to uh, stand out sharply. And I might add, in connection with all of these maps, that while in many areas uh, you can buy uh, maps, uh, wall-type maps, uh, they are too inclusive. And in college it's difficult to use them, and I'm sure in the eighth grade it would be even worse. So we have very freely interspersed uh, very simplified maps, almost a newspaper version, to make a certain point. Here is another type map to show the physiographic region. You will notice that uh, most of the captions are uh, at the bottom. Uh, you get uh, more for your money that way. Uh, in a few cases where the picture wasn't uh, suited for that, we had to have the captions uh, to the side. But uh, that's a waste of space. Now, again, if an instructor uh, were not acquainted with the various physiographic features and topographic features, uh, this slide wouldn't uh, mean much, but if they know something, they can use it uh, to an advantage. Uh, again, uh, you will note there is no attempt at chronology here, uh, simply as, uh, specific examples. Uh, we had uh, the artist up at uh, uh, SVE to uh, draw this, uh, showing uh, the probable route of the uh, mound builders. Uh, 
into North America, and of course, uh, eventually to Indiana. Again, in a very simplified fashion to show the uh, English, French, and Spanish uh, uh, sections of what later became the United States, or here in North America. So uh, again, that could be shown on a regular map, but it, this shows it more graphically. A very simplified version of the early French uh, uh, fortified post in Indiana. And uh, uh, if you pointed these out on uh, a very complicated map, uh, the uh, relative position of these places might be lost. Now, this perhaps wouldn't mean much to fourth graders. And here was another compromise we had to make, uh, but it does show the route that George Rogers Clark took uh, when uh, he came down the Ohio uh, and crossed over into Southern Illinois. Uh, you will note uh, almost in the center of the slide, there is a uh, place called Corn Island. That's where George Rogers Clark and his troops stayed the night before they left for their expedition, and I'll have a comment or two to make about that later. There, uh, we found this in a, an old uh, a book, and we uh, just had the artist put it in color. This again shows what uh, Clark had intended to uh, take, uh, the center of the British stronghold was Detroit, uh, but uh, as history shows, he, he never made it, although that was his ultimate objective. This, uh, again, is a simplified way of, uh, of pointing up the reward given to George Rogers Clark and his men for their revolutionary activities. And of course, in all of these cases, uh, the instructor can speak to the issue the map can be up there for as long as five or ten minutes uh, without uh, being disconcerting. Here is uh, another one. This is later in, this is 1763, uh, uh, beginning of the English period, showing the uh, extent of Pontiac's conspiracy uh, in the state of Indiana. Now, uh, I don't have all of this series. I think there are five in this series, but I wanted to to point up the divisions of the Northwest Territory in accordance with the ordinance, uh, the Northwest Ordinance. And to we experimented. We tried to do it all on one uh, map uh, with cross shading, but we found it was very complicated and could be very confusing. So in a series of uh, five. Uh, maps. We tried to show that with the creation of the Indiana Territory in 1800, uh, they took the major part of the uh, Northwest Territory. The Northwest Territory for two years prior to the admission of Ohio then was the eastern part. Here is one with the uh, territory of Illinois being formed. The uh, Territory of Michigan had already been formed in 1805. Uh, Ohio had been admitted as a state in 1803, or at least they thought they had been. In 1953, they got around to celebrating their sesquicentennial, and much to their horror, they discovered they had never been officially admitted. So uh, the delegates from Hawaii and Alaska very generously came forward and sponsored the admit admittance of Ohio. Uh, well, this is another one showing the subdivisions of the Northwest Territory. And, uh, well, I should have shown this first. Uh, this shows, according to the uh, uh, Northwest Ordinance, there were to be three, not less than three, but more than five states. You will observe that had they followed the Northwest Ordinance, uh, Indiana wouldn't have to worry about the burn ditch controversy because we had never even had that. But as in the case of Ohio and Illinois, uh, with the admission of Indiana, uh, the uh, Congress fudged and gave us 10 miles up from the tip of Lake Michigan and then drew an east to west line. Okay. Uh, here's a map which is designed to show the 
Indian treaties. And again, uh, having the names of the treaties here and the dates will uh, point up rather graphically, I think, that uh, the bulk of Indiana was Indian territory when the uh, uh, when William Henry Harrison was made uh, governor. Okay. Now here was a map to show uh, a very important treaty line uh, of '95, in which uh, uh, the only part of Indiana was this part called the Gore, a pie-shaped. Uh, now that was a part of the Northwest Territory from 1800 to 1802 when it was added to the uh, Indiana Territory. But you can see how uh, graphically you can make this with your lettering uh, done by professionals. Mm -hmm. Here is, uh, well, self-explanatory again, uh, isolating all extraneous materials to, to point out one specific uh, item. Again, we did it for the War of 1812, uh, in which the first fighting in the War of 1812 took place uh, in Indiana. And this uh, shows the uh, uh, penetration of the Indians primarily, but uh, in some cases the British, in, into Indiana. I keep reminding myself I'm not here to give a history uh, lecture, but to talk on film strips. So, if I uh, digress, you will excuse me. Here again, we try to show uh, very graphically the uh, movement of the capital from Vincennes to Corridon to make it more centrally located. This was done during the War of 1812. And I might add, the war had no effect on this removal. It was a matter that when the gore was added, uh, uh, the bulk of the population was uh, concentrated in that area. And to have the capital at the western side of the state uh, offended the easterners. This, I, we found uh, this map uh, in an old atlas. Of course, uh, it was in pastel shades or faded colors, I guess you'd say. So we simply, uh, in all cases of the maps, I drew a rough sketch and the artist then took it uh, from there. And we put it in uh, colors which would stand out better. Mm -hmm. Again, the famous new purchase uh, which uh, uh, followed the War of 1812. And of course, Indianapolis was included and in Muncie, uh, eight and a half million acres. And again, you could tell them eight and a half million acres, but by using a map of this type, you can point it up much more uh, uh, emphatically. And this is the final map. I know you're getting tired of looking at maps. Uh, this is a map showing a very ambitious internal improvement program of 1836. Uh, we have uh, the symbols there. That's slightly out of focus. I think uh, must be the slide uh, because I cut these out and slipped them into these temporary holders. It, on the film strip, it's better focus. Um, but again, this could be projected in a class and uh, you could uh, outline each type of internal improvement uh, far more effectively than you could uh, verbally, I'm sure. Okay. Now here are a, a couple of uh, 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 drawings, which are diagrams, which I had a former student, uh, Mr. Tom Howard, from uh, uh, he's now teaching at Greensburg High School. He was in this class. Uh, Indiana History gave an excellent report on the preliterate period, and uh, he's majoring now in geology. So uh, I asked him whether he would uh, draw uh, some diagrams to show the uh, preliterate, the geological period, the Cincinnati Arch, and how uh, erosion. Uh, the next slide now will show uh, in a graphic fashion how erosion took place and exposed the various layers you see uh, and then the manual explains these uh, more in detail now uh, this next 
uh, set of pictures are what we call action pictures. Uh, and I might add that we've tried to uh, uh, alternate the various kinds so as not to have a great concentration, uh, too much action or too many still shots. Uh, this we did not take. I happened to be there, though, a short time after it was taken. This is the excavations at the Angel Mounds uh, near Evansville uh, under the direction of Dr. Black. And uh, again, with this shot, uh, you could uh, explain how archaeologists work. Uh, many uh, people think they come in with a bulldozer and then sift the soil, and but it's very exacting. And, this would be interesting from that standpoint, I'm sure. Here it was a very simple drawing that uh, Byron uh, spruced up a bit with some uh, red paint. Uh, again, we were thinking primarily here of fourth graders, but it's a very a simple shot. It's very difficult to, uh, to tint. I tried to tint a few, but I was too formal and too uh, precise and uh, the, Byron, uh, being an artist, could give him a splash here, there, with a few highlights, and uh, quite effective. Here was a here's a case where we had to put the caption on the side, but again, it's an action picture. Maybe not the kind we should perpetrate, but uh, I mean, should perpetuate. But uh, and, uh, we found this in an old book. Here is one dealing with the uh, fur, uh, trading, uh, fur trading period, the French. This is, shows a portage. Uh, of course, we would have to point out that the birch bark canoe was not too common in Indiana. Uh, they used more of the duck at, dugout, which would take more than one man usually. But in some cases, they did use a lighter canoe and to carrying it from one uh, navigable uh, set of water to another. Uh, this would be called portage. Mm -hmm. This simply was to show basically for continuity in the story of the fur uh, trade, uh, the voyageurs and their, uh, uh, their uh, role in the fur trade in trapping. Again, uh, a keel boat. Uh, you can uh, tell about a keel boat. You can uh, explain how it was propelled, but by an actual drawing, you can show how uh, it was propelled. Here was a shot showing the meeting of Tecumseh and uh, William Henry Harrison at uh, Vincennes in 1811 or 1810. Uh, we wanted to put something about Lockery, the massacre of Lockery's troops uh, near present-day Aurora, which incidentally the creek is called Lockery's Creek, and we found this sketch in an old book and we simply uh, attended it. Uh, you'll notice this uh, is an interesting slide that it was to show the constant uh, Indian attacks on the frontier uh, many of them uh, were uh, uh, stockade area, but it wasn't a good picture. And you'll notice how Byron uh, took some paint and accentuated certain parts of it to bring out the more indistinct. Uh, it's an obvious exaggeration, but I think uh, it suffices. Mm -hmm. Now, this is an example of a highly romanticized uh, picture. I can't imagine anything uh, being less uh, authentic than that, and yet uh, this is typical of the uh, illustrative material that prevailed, so that uh, uh, I think it carries the idea that was intended, if mention is made, that it is highly romanticized. I think the next one is the same type. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not so romanticized, I guess, after all. This is a, a surrender of Hull during the War of 1812. Uh, I, they may have had that elaborate clothes, but uh, it was for show purposes only. 
Now here is an example. Uh, we didn't tint this. This was already uh, was a lithograph in color, and uh, uh, the uh, reputed slaying of Tecumseh by Richard N. Johnson, uh, who has the dubious honor of being made vice president on the basis of that claim. Uh, but uh, again, it's typical of the wealth of material that you find during wartime. Uh, we found it in the uh, French and Indian, I mean, in the French and Indian War, in the uh, uh, War of 1812, uh, the Mexican War, and the Civil War, to say nothing of the later wars. Here, of course, is a, a, a simplified drawing showing uh, the uh, barge on, on a canal. Uh, I think it does several things. It shows how it was propelled. It gives you some idea of the modest dimensions of the canal themselves. You can talk about a canal and immediately uh, students uh, tend to conjure up visions of, uh, of uh, Panama Canal. And actually, the canal era uh, in this period was very modest. This is one of the most common uh, pictures showing uh, the westward movement. Uh, I got a new book the other day, and this was on the cover sheet. Uh, this is an old print showing uh, how they moved uh, to the west. Again, another uh, uh, graphic uh, account of travel on the, on the waters, the flatboat, giving some idea of the crudity of these uh, uh, boats. I have a confession to make on this. Uh, maybe I won't make it in classes. This was taken in Illinois, uh, right across the border. But uh, in a film strip, uh, no one knows whether it was ill. We didn't find any oxen in uh, Indiana. Now, interspersed throughout the uh, uh, film strips, you'll find uh, what we call text frames. Uh, they are useful, it varies the pace some. Also, it bridges a gap where you can't find illustrative material, and yet you want to uh, add cohesiveness to the whole uh, story. So by putting in a, uh, a text frame, that can be accomplished. Now, uh, there are many monuments and memorials in Indiana. And while we have quite a few, we had to be very judicious in, in the choice, because if you aren't careful, you get some highly romanticized uh, plaques and, and monuments. But uh, this, of course, is at the Lincoln uh, State Park, and uh, uh, they're uh, on the four limestone relief they're dealing with Lincoln's life. One is the Indiana years, and this purportedly shows the Indiana years. Uh, another uh, memorial uh, to Lincoln's mother, uh, a very uh, a modest uh, marker. Incidentally, this marker wasn't put up until after Lincoln's assassination, and a friend of Lincoln, admirer of Lincoln, uh, marked his mother's grave at Lincoln City. another uh, uh, memorial, a monument, to the uh, chief Menominee. Mm -hmm. Another memorial. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, in, in the case of all monuments and memorials, the state has a standardized type of marker. Now, this particular marker is out on the road, uh, about a mile from uh, Pigeon Roost uh, Monument. Uh, and uh, again, much like a text frame, and I might add that this being out of focus here is because uh, the uh, film in the holder here is uh, not flat. Uh, the film strip, that wouldn't be out of focus. Mm -hmm. Another uh, monument, one of the most impressive a uh, Tippecanoe monument. This, of course, uh, is a very impressive one. This was built uh, uh, by the federal government. I 
had the pleasure of being there when Franklin Delano Roosevelt uh, dedicated this. Uh, it has since been turned over to the state of Indiana. Uh, the inside of the rotunda, you uh, find uh, a monument of uh, Clark, and uh, the walls are covered with uh, uh, murals. Uh, we tried to take the uh, picture of the murals, but it was very difficult. And of course, this is the first uh, uh, territorial capital building uh, at Vincennes. Uh, now, this uh, points out one thing I wanted to make, uh, an occasional anachronism. Uh, sometimes you can avoid it, other times you can't. Uh, most of the times you can avoid it. But when you have a building which uh, was erected uh, uh, 200 years ago, uh, or 175 years ago, and then in the background I have a 1962 Chevy, uh, you have to do some explaining. But uh, at least uh, you can minimize the uh, uh, danger of anachronisms. Here is, uh, we have one or two of these, simply a bronze plaque. This happens to be on the uh, Pigeon Roof Massacre. Uh, it, the light was right, it uh, was in bronze, it uh, rather impressed Byron, so we took it and then included it in the strip. <laughs> uh, Byron took some very nice uh, uh, interior shots. This is of the uh, first territorial capital building, the building you saw the uh, frame or two before. Uh, again, it uh, shows you the type of furniture and also uh, shows you the uh, rather modest dimensions of those uh, buildings. Uh, I remember I, one year, in my one and only field trip of any consequence, I took uh, 45 students on a field trip. And when we came to this place, the uh, guide was uh, telling us uh, how uh, Horsehead Gibson had shot an Indian there, and he pointed to the spot. Uh, and immediately you could see the blood, except that when you found out that they just replaced that floor three years before, uh, he forgot to tell us about that. We, uh, this proved rather disappointing. We couldn't put it in color, although we did mount it on a blue background, which I don't know why it doesn't show here. But we wanted to take up a very important set of publications. We have all of these in the Ball State Library, incidentally. Uh, which gave much of the early history of Indiana. And uh, this, uh, we simply then uh, compromised that by uh, uh, taking the, uh, the title page of uh, one of these publications. Mm -hmm. Now here, uh, in taking the French period, when we explain how uh, Celeron de Bienville uh, came down the Ohio River to uh, formally claim the area for the King of France after the British had begun to make inroads, uh, he would sink these lead plates, uh, formally uh, claiming it for uh, uh, France. And we simply uh, took a picture of one of these inscriptions. And I might add that the uh, manual appropriately has a translation. Now here are a group, uh, a series of artifacts that I want to show. This is an example of the photography of Dr. Black. Uh, a, a tremendous uh, master craftsman. Uh, when we were touring the Angel Mound, we went through his uh, uh, photography laboratory and I noticed uh, he had a uh, uh, camera uh, on an I-beam. And I commented that that seemed like awfully uh, light equipment to have to have an I-beam to support it. He pointed out that in the beginning of this project, he wanted to take these exact photographs. And he noticed that when he stepped on the floor, sometimes there'd be a slight jiggle. So he got tired of that, simply put an I-beam in cement, ran it up free of the floor. And uh, he had pretty good fidelity after that. Uh, another one of the artifacts at the Angel Mound. Mm -hmm. I don't want to take up too much time. What time is it? Uh, uh, these are, were very attractive, showing some of the uh, cultural uh, aspects of the pre-literate period, the mound builders. Mm -hmm.
this is uh, his pride and joy, and I'm sure that uh, uh, I couldn't have uh, done justice to it. Uh, and the lighting and the background uh, is, I confess this to uh, Bob McCall last night when he was out. He thought uh, we did an excellent job on this, so I had to tell him that this is Professor Black. John. Mm -hmm. That it was uh, so pretty we didn't want to leave it out, so we thought that uh, it was at a break. Uh, we could, uh, some instructor could find uh, things to talk about, particularly for the fourth grade. Mm -hmm. This uh, deals with the uh, frontier period showing a common bullet mold. Mm -hmm. Now, these are from the Ottoman prints that they keep locked up in the safe at Indianapolis. I don't know what they measure, but I think they're around three and a half by five feet. And uh, uh, we simply laid them on the floor, and Byron uh, adjusted the camera and uh, again, this is, of course, uh, very colorful. The next slide is the beaver, which was the uh, most prized of all the uh, animals of the fur trading period. Occasionally, we would uh, include a mural. This shows the seating of uh, uh, Harmony to, uh, by uh, Father Rapp to Robert Owen. This is an early, I think we got this in Harper's Weekly, showing the inside of a, a, a schoolroom, a drawing, portraying the inside of a schoolroom. These type of uh, drawings are abundant. Uh, you have to be very careful, though, to find out uh, whether the drawing is accurate insofar as the number of uh, uh, these blockhouses. Now we are to a series of, of portraits. Uh, this we, is not the portrait of uh, William Henry Harrison that hangs in the governor's office, but in, instead it was, uh, I think, uh, during the campaign of 1840, and uh, we simply took a picture of that. Uh, this is a, we didn't hint this. They tried to do this uh, chemically up at the SVE and it worked out all right, except that the cost was prohibitive. So uh, this is the only, uh, this was a black and white negative that they processed in a certain way. It can be done, but it's, uh, the cost is prohibitive. This is the, uh, he was called Horsehead Gibson, the first secretary of the territory. This uh, is the uh, second territorial uh, uh, governor and uh, uh, this hangs in uh, Lieutenant Governor Ristine's office, and it was one of our better shots, but uh, Thomas Posey, uh, Posey County was named after him. Uh, I'm sure at the time he served as territorial uh, governor was uh, much older than that. Mm -hmm. This is the first governor of the state of Indiana, uh, Jonathan Jennings. Uh, you can uh, see here, uh, this is an example of what was done after the Civil War to go back and take uh, sketches, uh, some of them charcoal sketches, and uh, a, a, an artist then would paint a portrait on the basis of information supplied in that fashion. Mm -hmm. uh, this is no fault of the picture, but it's a, one of the most interesting of the uh, governor's portraits. Uh, the uh, paint was very thick and it almost looked amateurish, but that was uh, found up in the gallery at uh, uh, Indianapolis. Uh, there's an interesting story to tell about uh, this man, but we don't have time. I don't know what we're going to do on governors when we get to the 1920s and find one went to penitentiary and the other one should have gone, but uh, we'll find some way to include their portraits without giving all the gruesome details, maybe. This is an example of an important figure in the French period, uh, of whom we did not have any uh, suitable uh, drawing. 
So, however crude the drawing, we felt it should be included, and it was very difficult to tint. This is a George Crowan, a uh, very fine drawing, and of course the uh, now this was done on sepia tone, and it tinted much easier. Mm -hmm. Now I can skip some of these time doing that. I don't want to. Here was one of the worst uh, pictures we had, and yet uh, we try, uh, felt that this man, who was one of the very important men during at the land office at Ben Sands, and we were very fortunate to find it. So we uh, did include it. Uh, Byron had to do quite a, a bit of uh, improvising here to bring out the outline in sharp relief. Mm -hmm. And this was equally poor, but also an important uh, early man. Father Chabot was the uh, uh, priest at Vincennes, or at Kaskaskia, who helped uh, uh, Clark take Vincennes the first time without firing a shot. And uh, the more we thought about it, uh, however poor the uh, drawing was, it is an interesting picture. Mm -hmm. Now, we went specially to Jeffersonville to take a picture of Corn Island and also the falls, since the falls figured very prominently in uh, George Rogers Clark mission. We got down there <coughs> in late April, and uh, it was high water, and secondly, they had already built a lock and dam there, which changes the whole uh, position of the falls. And furthermore, we discovered that Corn Island had long since disappeared. But then in a very old book, we found this painting. And we were going to use it, except uh, it had a, a bridge in the background. And we could hardly use it to show George Rogers Park Mission with a bridge in the background. So, so we used transparent oils in the early part, uh, but in this case, uh, Byron used opaque uh, colors to blot out the bridge. It looks like a stormy horizon. This, of course, is a very uh, important, uh, interesting woman in early Indiana history, Julia DeMont, the teacher of Edward Eggleston. Another uh, temporary resident of Indiana at New Harmony was uh, a national, if not an international figure, Francis Wright. And we thought we wanted to include that in developing the uh, New Harmony movement. Mm -hmm. Now we have here, the uh, next three or four shots, are a series of restorations. Uh, this was done by a man from the Ohio State Museum, but uh, it is an excellent example of how the archaeologists can, by finding disturbed earth, indicate where the uh, posts were, and then uh, you get the dimensions of the building. And then when you get to the uh, literate period, men like DeSoto uh, coming into the southern part of the United States uh, and writing about it, you can put two and two together and come up with a thoughtful approximation of what uh, the mound builders' uh, buildings must have looked like. Now this is at the Angel Mound, and uh, Professor Black and his group took great care to, in the excavations, and they found the disturbed earth, and they formed a pattern, pattern, and they assumed that this must have been some sort of fortification, and then with money from the State Historical Society, they undertook to uh, reconstruct that fortification, which goes back seven, six, seven hundred years. They simply had poles, and they intertwined them with sticks, and then covered them with a stucco. Here is Fort Necessity, which figures during the French period. Uh, I wrote to the Department of Interior for a photograph, and they very generously sent me one. But it, first of all, was black and white, and we couldn't use it. And it was rather vague. But in order to show the dimensions, uh, and show the fort. I sent this to the artist, and from the photograph then, he reconstructed uh, uh, this uh, picture of, of uh, Fort Necessity. Here's another uh, a fort that has been reconstructed. This is at Weatonen, present-day West Lafayette. Uh, 
an excellent example uh, to show students the uh, dimensions. Mm -hmm. This uh, was recently uh, dedicated the oldest church in Indiana. Mm -hmm. This was a difficult shot. This shows the uh, canal crossing a river. And they, uh, of course, uh, the light wasn't too good, but uh, the structure could explain just how they did that. Here is from the Lincoln Village at Rockport. Again, uh, uh, people who are historically minded, and incidentally they charge a, a, a fee, uh, have reconstructed this uh, village. Mm -hmm. Now that's uh, Mr. Shirtliff sitting uh, on the outline of the Lincoln cabin uh, at Lincoln City. Uh, I actually set up the easel and everything. I squeezed the button. Uh, uh, but we had a, a person there because it adds life to it, and secondly, it gives you some idea of uh, uh, relative dimensions. Uh, this, of course, uh, at one time housed eight or nine people. You know, uh, it's a little wonder they spent a lot of time outside. Uh, here is uh, a mural we found to indicate the type of political stump speakers of the frontier period. This is a painting that we got permission to reproduce. Now, to change the pace occasionally, we would include uh, broadsides or circulars of this type. Uh, we couldn't have pictures to show what we wanted to, but we would simply add this, and uh, then it would be up to the teacher, of course, to take it from there. Now, the next two, this picture and the next one, are very simplified drawings. Uh, which uh, perhaps would be appreciated by fourth graders, showing how the uh, people uh, improvised during the frontier. Mm -hmm. Another simple drawing. We had uh, uh, the winter collection, and we found these very attractive paintings of Indians who lived are figured in Indiana history. Now, this is uh, Joseph Brandt, the man who uh, led the attack on Colonel Lockery. Uh, another one of the winter's paintings. Black Hawk, who crossed Indiana during the Black Hawk War. Mm -hmm. This we borrowed from General Motors. Uh, we wanted to show Pontiac's influence in Indiana, so we wrote to Pontiac Division of General Motors. They very graciously uh, gave us written permission to, to use this. Again, uh, they've captured uh, the idea there's something we couldn't have done if we uh, had tried to draw. I think that's about all Oh, uh, here's, of course, the state flag which uh, is available at the State House, but sometimes it would be interesting to project it. The State Seal, and again, the instructor could explain how this was uh, arrived at. Now, we wanted to, sh in the pre literate period, to show the glaciated period. We wanted a picture of a glacier, but of course, uh, Indiana doesn't have many glaciers anymore, so I talked to uh, Major uh, uh, Whitmer, who had just come back from Alaska with this aerial view, so he uh, let us use it. And I got this from the uh, Museum of Natural History at Chicago to show the, uh, in the pre literate period, the animal life. To again break the pace, we have sometimes had both maps and charts. These shows the early colleges and universities in Indi Indiana chartered before the Civil War. Uh, another chart, uh, very colorful, uh, but uh, with figures that uh, could be useful. Uh, this is an example uh, of archaeologists at work showing the disturbed sections of Earth, uh, which uh, enables them to discern a pattern of some kind. Mm -hmm. 
this is a picture taken after the excavations had been completed, and there you see many different patterns. Uh, this should prove interesting to children. Uh, you'll notice there again the care with which the archaeologists have, uh, they would photograph that, carefully catalog it before they removed it. This I borrowed from TMS. Uh, Duane, did you take that picture? I think you did. Uh, we went in the pioneer period. The, of course, we again have a slight anachronism with the black top in the, the background. I think we have one. No, that's all. Now, I hope I haven't taken too much time, but if there are any questions, uh, or comments. I even entertain comments. I don't know what they'll be. Yes. I'd like to know how to get caption on the frame. Well, it's a pretty intricate process. I watched them up at Chicago. They do it. And they print them up, and I don't know how they do it. You know, it's not a tight strip. Oh no! Oh no! No, they, no they, they're in relief, I believe, and they stand out better. Yes, oh yes. In fact, uh, the professional aspects here were all done by the Society for Visual Education. I think uh, the whole project, I think these figures are right, about $5,000 to produce. Anyone else have a... Yes, Kent. These are these have been out for a year. The second uh, series we hope to finish by old Christmas, but the first six have been out for a year. Uh, we're not commercializing here today. They're thirty nine ninety five. That ninety five wasn't my doing. Uh, those mundane matters I leave to Mr. Harville. But he's been, he's done this in, I think, 18 states. This is the second state history series that he's done. He did a pilot study in uh, Alabama. But as he pointed out, uh, financially in Alabama, it's just not feasible to, to produce a set because if you, 12 strips would run around $10,000 and he thinks he, they'll do well if they break even. And of course, in Indiana, the consolidation movement will have to, that effect. Or it might have a better effect, I don't know. It's been a pleasure.